Awesome. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our International Student Speaker Series panel. We are Study Hall College Consulting. It, me it means so much for you all to join us for our event this evening. So we'll give you all a few seconds to come in from the meeting waiting room. So for this event tonight, here is our agenda. We'll start with introducing our webinar hosts, talking a little bit about Study Hall College Consulting and our services, introducing our student panelists, going into the Q&A portion, which is what you all are here for this evening, and then a little bit about our final remarks at the end of the panel. So if you attend our international student panel until the end and you can complete our attendance form, you will receive 10% off your next study hall college consulting purchase. And that is for those of you who have attended the event live. So definitely stick around till the end if you wanted to get that attendance form and code. So hello everyone, my name is Rachel. I am one of the co-hosts for this panel this evening. I recently graduated from UC Berkeley in May 2020, where I double majored in cognitive science and legal studies. And now I am currently working full-time at a law firm. So I'm an out-of-state student to Berkeley where I'm originally from Maryland. A little bit about me in college, I was super involved Involved in the Department of Residential Life, where I was a senior resident assistant. I also worked as a hiring and training coordinator with Residential Life. Basically, we helped to hire all of the resident assistants, peer tutors that worked in the dorm. I was also a campus ambassador, also known as a tour guide for the university, and I was involved in the ASUC, which is the student government for Berkeley. Hi everyone, my name is David. I'm one of the consultants here at Study Hall Consulting and I'll be moderating tonight's section or tonight's discussion on being an international student. And for a little background on myself, I'm a fourth year at Berkeley studying economics and minoring in data science. I actually transferred from UCSB to Berkeley in fall 2019 and I'm from San Jose, California. And a couple of things that I've been involved with at school are the Berkeley Forum, which is a nonpartisan organization at Berkeley that hosts debates and panels on campus, and the American Marketing Association, a marketing organization at UCSB. So a little bit about Study Hall College Consulting. We have two main services, which we'll talk about. We have the College Application Essay Review Service is our first main service. So basically with our College Application Essay Review, we will review your essays, such as the Common Application, Supplemental Essays, your Letter of Continued Interest, if you are waitlisted or deferred for any colleges, and also the UC personal insight questions. So if you all are transfer students or seniors, rising seniors in high school right now applying to colleges, you definitely need to start thinking about your college application essays as the time is coming very close where you'll have to start submitting these essays. So when we're looking at these college application essays, we will do holistic and detailed advice. So we'll be reading your essays and leaving our comments throughout. We'll look through your entire story, especially if it's like multiple essays that you're having us review, such as the UC personal insight questions. For that application, you have to submit four essays to apply to any of the UCs. And so if you do choose that option, we'll look at those for essays and then see what you're sharing with the admissions officers in each essay to make sure that you have a story, that you're sharing different things and they're not repeats of one another. Also in our essay review, we'll look at grammar, vocabulary, sentence structure, your thesis, making sure that you're putting your best foot forward in these essays. We'll also type out paragraph explanations of our thoughts and how we think you can improve this essay. But as always, it's just our thoughts and you do not have to take our comments, but we are just giving suggestions. 
And then our second main service is the college and career coaching calls. And so this has been a very popular service recently where we basically speak one on one with students and with parents about anything, any questions that you may have about the college application process, college essays or general college experiences. So as some ideas, we can work together to brainstorm essays, talk about big picture essay discussion, we can work to create some college lists. And recently for those incoming college students, we have been talking a lot of one on one conversations about how to create your college schedule, finding classes, finding housing, good housing versus bad housing, joining clubs in college and finding internships and job prospects after college. So if you are a new client who has never purchased our services before and you wanted to get to know us a little bit better, we do offer one complimentary 15-minute consultation so you can have any questions answered before working with us. So with that, we will start introducing our wonderful panel this evening. Great, thank you, Rachel. I can go first. Hi, everyone. I'm Ishita. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I graduated from UC Berkeley in 2019, and I did a double major with a rather unconventional mix of economics and English. I'm currently based in the Bay Area. I'm working at the Center for Equity, Gender, and Leadership, which is a nonprofit, and I'm doing sort of diversity, equity, and inclusion related work for them. I'm originally from Mumbai, India. While I was at Berkeley, I was involved in a variety of initiatives, including student government, a student org called Berkeley Women in Business, um, Cal Alumni Student Association, and Optimere Consulting. And over the years, as I, I sort of realized where my interests lay, I sort of narrowed that down and took on leadership opportunities with the student government and uh, Berkeley Women in Business. Okay, hi everyone, Jade here, um, pronoun she, her. I, um, I graduated in 2019 uh, from UC Berkeley, where I double majored in industrial engineering and operations research, as well as economics. I'm currently a business strategy consultant with um, Accenture Strategy, I'm where I'm currently based in um, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. That's where I'm from and I'm back at home, um, working in my home, home country. So when I was in college, um, I was involved in um, Berkeley, the Berkeley project, which is like a, uh, which is a nonprofit. Like a, we we do community service work. I was also involved in. in Jade, I think you may have cut out there for a second. Oh dear, I think my internet connection is unstable. Where was I paused? Um, basically at your college involvement. Okay, so while at college, I was involved in the Berkeley Project, which is a community service club. Um, I was also a part of finance as well as um, consulting related clubs just to um, explore some of my interests. And I was also involved in the Malaysian Student Association. Hey everyone, it's Derek. Um, I also graduated from UC Berkeley. I graduated December of 2019 and I majored in business administration. Currently, I'm working as a consultant with EY Parthenon out of San Francisco. Um, my hometown is Taipei, Taiwan. That's where I grew up um, before I decided to go to college in the, U uh, in the States. Uh, while in college, I was just like Rachel, heavily involved in the residential community, served as a resident assistant for three years. Um, was also part of a consulting club, hence being a consultant right now, always had an interest in consulting, also a part of a finance club. Um, yeah, super excited and looking forward to answering other questions. Hey guys, I'm Sparsh. Um, also graduated 2020 with a double major in operations research in management science and business. That's a handful. Um, I'm also working at UI Parthenon, but within the software strategy group, uh, also based out of the San Francisco office. My hometown is Dubai, UAE, but I grew up 
in India for the first 10 ish years of my life and then traveled and then traveled here for school. Uh, at college, I was a part of a political club called Bridge USA and worked in the student government with Rachel and uh, played a bunch of cricket and was a part of my uh, religious organization. But yeah, that's a bit about me. Awesome. And without further ado, we'll get started with the first section of our panel tonight, which is about the college experience. And a reminder to the audience, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask, please put them in the uh, chat pod. Um, and the first question is gonna go to Ishta and to the other panelists, please do feel free to speak as well if you have anything to add. So first question, what is the best part about going to college abroad? Thank you for that question. That's a great question. So I think there's two, two aspects to it. One, there's the professional growth aspect to it. I think there's a lot of value in immersing yourself in an academic system that's different from one that you're used to. I think we're all working at organizations that have some sort of international ties. And so there's a lot of value to having some sort of project-based learning, um, you know, being able to understand how different industries and opportunities operate in different countries, uh, understand how the skills that you've gained in your home country align with what's out there in the world, as well as gain additional professional skills. And then on the on the personal side as well, just by virtue of living in an entirely new environment for a few years, there's a lot of independence, right? You're um, suddenly responsible for a lot of uh, different decisions. You're figuring out housing on your own. I think there's a lot of growth that comes from that. And then you're also suddenly involved in, or, or you know, building a much more diverse network of individuals that you're able to interact with. And there's immense value in interacting with people that have different lived experiences and different, you know, cultural cultures than yourself. And I think I found that both the professional and personal growth aspects have positioned me really well for career opportunities and working with and leading individuals, both, you know, within the US or if I choose to go back to my home country or, or travel elsewhere. I feel like Ishita basically addressed, um, I think, the merits of going abroad and the answers pretty much align with mine, right? So I wanted to go abroad. I want to study overseas um, for those two main reasons as well. Like I think exposure especially was the main one that really gave, that made me really want to go study abroad because being in your home country, I mean, um, I, I've, lived, I've lived in Malaysia for like 20 years prior to going college abroad. And I knew I wanted to um, learn from different people, hear about their own stories um, from a different background, right? Uh, from non-Malaysians. So that's really why I wanted to study abroad. And um, I think um, quality education is another key, uh, key factor. So when I applied to college, I looked not only at the US, but also at the UK, at Singapore, places which offer um, quality education. So I think these are some of the considerations. Thank you. And on the flip side, what is the worst or most difficult part about going to college abroad? And Jade, we can start with you again. Okay, thanks for this question. Worst part, um, I would say is having to start from scratch. So for myself, spending that 20 years back at home and going abroad suddenly, it's like you're thrown into a completely new place where you've got no network, you don't have your family and friends there, you have to establish everything from scratch. So that's the worst part, but also is the best part because while you have to start figure everything out for yourself, your housing, your food, start cooking all, all your meals, how you want to settle that, how do you want to mix in a completely new environment, start making friends, expand outside of your current network. Um, that was hard for me because I think within the first, first month or first, first few weeks at least, you're, you're like, okay, how do I start making friends? I can start with my resident association, um, with my with my with my floor mates and so on. And then you have to you have to you can start figuring out um, what kind of clubs and societies you want to get involved in. Um, what are some of the interests that I want to pursue? Uh, what are some skills I have that might make me? I mean, what are some clubs that I join that can help enhance some of the personal skills that I really want to develop? So those were tough questions to figure out, especially alone. <laughs> when you're abroad in a foreign land. But I think it's going through these challenging times that make you grow the most as an individual, um, regardless of professional or personal growth. Um, so I think that's the, that's the most challenging part. 
but of course it comes with a lot more freedom and a lot more um a lot more freedom a lot more exposure in which we can speak about a bit later um should i pass on to you ishida sure yeah i absolutely want to echo what you said i think that building a network both a personal network, a support system from scratch is really difficult. And so is, you know, starting to network professionally, especially if you want to stay in the United States or wherever you choose to go to, to college um, for a few years to work after, after you study. Um, I would also add that um, some of the other logistical things that you need to figure out, like all of the paperwork that you need to file, figuring out housing, these are all rather, you know, challenging things that you have to suddenly figure out on your own and, you know, in addition to paying international student tuition. So I think that there are a lot of challenges, but also want to echo Jade in that being able to um, being able to overcome these challenges, being able to figure out these decisions on your own. And that's not to say that there isn't help available. I think it's just a, the matter of like, you've spent so many years building that already and now suddenly you have to seek out that help on your own. That's difficult. But yeah, um, being able to overcome these challenges definitely adds to the sort of uh, personal and professional growth that I alluded to in my previous answer. Awesome. So both of you kind of talked about pros and cons of studying abroad, obviously. And we actually do have a question in the chat pod from Sri. Is it worth to go to college abroad? So I'll ask this to Derek and then anyone else can kind of jump in if you have any that as well. Sure, uh, thanks for the question. I, I think to me, of course, looking back at the experience, I would say it was worth it um, just in terms of achieving personal growth and being able to really put forth my career aspirations and start achieving the goals that I set out for myself. I think these are all, you know, great ways of learning about yourself and really growing as a person when, um, and these are experiences that you, you only get when you travel abroad and you're put into to an unfamiliar environment and you're able to and you have to overcome these challenges. I think that's when growth really happens. So for me, you know, without these experiences, I, I never would have gotten to the place that I am today. Uh, and, you know, to me is extremely worth it. Um, just to follow up, I think there's definitely a lot of value. I think there's, there's a couple components to this. One is um, just financial ability to be able to justify a decision to study abroad, um, provided you are financially able and are able to seek the required funding to travel and study abroad, definitely good opportunity. That said, uh, it's definitely not the end of the world and it's not, uh, there's, there's, no, uh, there's, there's nobody saying if you don't study abroad, you know, you're, you're set to fail or anything like that. So, um, if it's for an undergraduate education, which is just considerably more expensive than uh, just like a master's degree, um, totally fine to actually study in your own home country if you can find the right resources and the right schools. Um, and if your objective is to live abroad in the future or to work abroad in the future, then it makes sense to consider, you know, doing like postgraduate studies or studies after um, that's slightly cheaper. It, uh, actually lends yourself to slightly better opportunities because you come with a good set of background and you know experience but provided you are financially able I think is like a very important factor if you're not you should definitely consider actually just studying at home um, it's it just saves yourself a lot more trouble in the future and it, it, it in no way uh, did I feel like uh, I would have lost out if I studied back home in like my own home country and then gone to do a master's totally fine so the, to answer your question, is it worth it to go to college abroad? It's worth it if you can. Um, and even if you cannot, you can definitely seek out these opportunities later on in your college like experience or your learning journey. It doesn't have to be immediately after college, like high school. So all of you have kind of touched on some of the difficulties on studying abroad. And obviously one of the biggest ones has to be homelessness or homesickness. Um, so do you think you get homesick often and how often do you actually go back home uh, to see your family? And we can start with Sparsh. Sure, uh, definitely get homesick uh, during college, at least in the, in the pre-pandemic life, used to be able to travel almost every six months or so, whatever the semesters would end, um, would take the first flight back. And oftentimes, a lot of the international students would also take their first flight back with me. 
to, to their own respective home country. So definitely see that. Um, how do you tackle homesickness? Uh, food is a big one for me. Um, I like cooking. And if you don't like cooking, you should learn how to cook. That's a great way to uh, stay in touch. Uh, the world's not that small, big a place anymore. There's the internet. So uh, definitely I call my family every like twice a day. And so that really helps out. Um, and yeah, I think as long as you are in touch with everyone back home and you have food as a support system, uh, those are all always helpful. Um, in my case, I was very blessed to actually have roommates from abroad throughout college. And a lot of times people um, can use that as a way to just have that comfort space at home and, you know, go out in the wild and have all the friends from wherever you're studying. Uh, but actually having roommates just from your home country is very helpful. Um, it's actually like a source of comfort for your parents as well when it comes to just, you know, who you're living with and who you're interacting with on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's sort of like those sort of things can be like super helpful uh, if you want to tackle homesickness while you're in whatever country. Awesome. And is it difficult to take college classes solely in English in the United States? Did you feel like you couldn't keep up because you were taught in a non-English language before? And I'll point this one towards Derek. Yeah, great question. I think to me, that was definitely a source of struggle, especially during my freshman year. Uh, you know, I went to a local high school, so none of my curriculum was in English. So it was definitely a big jump when, you know, you're required to take these reading and writing classes first semester when you're on campus. Um, but I think, you know, what at least UC Berkeley does pretty well is providing you with resources. And a lot of colleges have these resources um, that help you really step into that comfort zone. You know, they have tutors and all the professors are very understanding. You know, I remember going up to my professor asking for an extension on my paper because I thought I was, um, you know, falling behind and all of the professors are extremely understanding and they gave me the time and the resources and the extra coaching to be able to really get to that place. So I would say it was definitely an adjustment period involved. But, and I think this sort of goes back to echoing what Sparse said, finding that support system and whether that's finding a, a community of other international students are going through the same thing and helping each other out or, or finding professors that dealt with this problem before and you know, are willing to, to give you coaching uh, extra on the side. I think these are all ways that you will be able to overcome this challenge. I would say it's a challenge. It is, it does require an adjustment period, but it's not uh, like a extremely difficult obstacle to overcome, especially with the resources at hand and the other international students around you that are going through the same thing. So it's definitely a challenge, but it is one that you can overcome. Thank you. And final question for this section, and I'll point this one towards Jade. Do you feel like there is a stigma against international students? Okay, honest answer, I don't think so. And if this is your main consideration that's um, stopping you from considering an overseas education, please get that out of your head. I know it might be, um, it might be scary, right? You might feel apprehensive about going abroad um, in a foreign land, especially I think with a lot of the um, Asian hate um, that, that came up in the past year or so. Um, generally, I feel that in main cities, it doesn't happen. In fact, as an international student, I felt that I had a unique story to tell. Um, people were intrigued to find out what I could share, what different perspective I can offer. So different clubs, so different classes, and it helped in making conversations and, it's in, in, and in spreading some of your thinking and perspectives. So my answer is a direct is definitely a no, um, but I understand your apprehension if you have any. Um, but I feel like there are enough resources for you to get through it in case you experience any as well. Um, there were, I mean, when I was a resident assistant, there are plenty of resources where you could you could seek help, right? If if any of those happen to you, you can get additional help to get through this. If anyone wants to add on, feel free to. If not, I'll move on to a question in the chat actually from Bao. Did you know did you know people from your home country before going? Or how did you meet other international students? And Ishta, if you want to answer. Yeah, I can start off uh, on that one. So I was fortunate enough to know people from my home country. In fact, uh, to even know one or two people from my high school who were 
going to attend the same university or at least be in the same um, general area as me. So that was definitely a source of comfort, but um, I never felt like I couldn't find a community of international students because um, as soon as I arrived, there was an orientation event specifically for international students. And that was incredibly helpful in starting to build that first sense of community as I arrived at university. And then, you know, there I've talked about some of the student orgs that I was involved with, and those were primarily professional based. But there are a lot of student organizations that are based around community building for international students based on, you know, shared cultures and really help you make those connections. And so uh, there's those student orgs also tend to host events around the time that your home country typically celebrates festivals. Um, uh, and, and I think those are a really great opportunity to meet fellow international students or just people with, with shared interests. Yeah. We'll move on to the next section then, which is around applying to college. And this first question is going to go to Sparsh. Do you have any advice for writing personal statement essays? Yeah, sure. So I think the the first step typically is just like write down a bunch of ideas that you have and just start identifying very random things about yourself and your personality. It might be as simple as something that you something very simple that you do every day for yourself or it can be something that you really like or care about these shouldn't be big topics like i like in my personal opinion this is like it's like nobody like it's it's a very like a personal statement is personal and so you don't need to address big ideas and write about big things and write about big impact it's not about that it's a very personal thing and the person who's reading these just wants to learn about you and who you are as a person and what re truly represents your identity and where you come from. Uh, they, they don't care like about like world issues and this and that. If you have an involvement with it, sure, go for it. But like a good starting point typically is just starting to just assess your own personal life and see what are some types of things that you feel are relatively unique to you. And if you don't feel like they're unique to you, think again, because someone else probably thinks that they're unique and you might think everyone does it, but you should just start like like a big list, put all those things down and, and have one or two people who you are close to who you can discuss this with. Ideally, this should not be someone from your family because your family is just always there to support you. Uh, you might have like tough parents and like tough siblings and stuff, but to be honest, like they're still rooting for you. So it's not that helpful, but maybe you should go and like ask like a third party who like really does not care about you or your success uh, and, and try to bounce those ideas off them. And I feel like that's typically a good start, but I know that everyone had a very unique journey. So I want to pass it off uh, to, to someone else to actually share about their things. But this is how I would start, just make a list. I would definitely echo that. Please don't worry if you can't immediately identify a life altering experience. I mean, we're typically 17, 18 when we're writing these essays and we have so much life ahead of us to still live and experience. So these, you know, what you typically end up writing about, same, similarly in my experience, is something as innocuous as a conversation or just a very minor incident that ended up changing my mindset or leading to personal growth. And, you know, don't worry if you feel like an experience that you've had is very specific to your country or your culture. I assure you that the the growth and the learning and you know everything that that is make that is part of your journey is something that is very easily understood and can very easily translate to audiences outside of your country as well. And so I would also definitely treat this essay writing component as honestly a way to understand more about yourself as you articulate your journey. So similarly to Sparse, something that worked for me is jotting down sort of a rough timeline or, or storyline of how, how I got to the college application process uh, in the first place. And that helped me identify some key elements of my story and narrow down the experiences, the, the, the little things that stood out to me the most. Awesome. And I'll point this question towards Derek. So international student tuition is expensive. So how are you paying for college? And do you have any tips around actually getting money uh, to pay for college in general? Yeah, great question. Um, like you mentioned, international student tuition is definitely very, very expensive. So I think just like a lot of my fellow panelists, we've all gone through a struggle of trying to figure out 
you know, how to cut back on living costs or how to get extra, you know, extra couple of hundred dollars a month to be able to pay for living expenses. And like Sparser mentioned before, I think first thing you have to assess is whether you are actually in uh, the financial state to be able to afford um, uh, studying abroad. I, I guess the last thing you would want is to be um, in over your head and um, have to be in massive debts after you graduate college. But speaking of debts, I think, you know, student loans is definitely an option. I, pers I personally utilize them um, a lot. Uh, so, you know, I think that's definitely the first option and that's the easiest option. Second of all, in terms of living costs, which is also a big, you know, source of struggle for myself when I was in, at UC Berkeley, like I mentioned, just like Rachel, I served as, as a resident assistant, which, you know, gave me free room and board for the majority of my, you know, time at Berkeley. So I was really grateful to have that opportunity. And there's definitely opportunities on campus that you can pursue that that give you a perks like that, whether that's being a teacher, teaching assistant, being a resident assistant, or even just working at, you know, the dorm restaurant, which I did for like my first two years when I was at college. There are definitely ways where you can get extra income and subsidize your costs while you're, while you're at college. Um, but I think before going through all that, cutting down on the costs, these viable options, you first still have to assess whether um, without, you know, without these opportunities, you would actually able to afford college abroad. But there are definitely ways out there. I would add in a perspective about applying for scholarships. That's, that's basically how I got to the US. Um, I was basically funded by the Malaysian government, which is also why I'm back home right now. But if that's one way that you can consider that gets you abroad, get to the exposure, get to the international experience, that's something you can consider. I also know quite a number of international students um, from Singapore specifically um, with government funded um, scholarships from the yeah, statutory boards. Um, and there are also university um, funding that you can apply for. Um, like for the UC system, they've got the region, there are region scholars, there are also other programs that you can apply to that can potentially subsidize some of your education costs. Awesome. And going back to kind of applying to college. So obviously in the United States, applying to schools, a really big thing is obviously the extracurricular activities, but not every country kind of has that same focus. So we have a question. What if my school doesn't offer any extracurricular activities? And is it possible to get accepted into schools in the United States without these extracurriculars? And Jade, I'll point this back to you. I think that's totally fine. You honest, I okay, um, I might offer a different perspective here. I don't think it's mandatory to have extra extracurricular activities for you to get into college, even though I personally did, um, because I think what the US or what most of the schools, um, they really take credit for is your experience. So if your school does not have extracurricular activities and you are, and you're, you have it, but you still have an interesting story to tell. It could be that, you know, you're spending most of your time studying. You're also helping your parents out with their business. You have to you help take care of your siblings. These are all unique life experiences that you can add to your personal statements when you write them. And it shows that, you know, um, you may not have the ability or the privilege to have that, to have that additional time to take part in all, in all these extracurricular activities that you can add to your, person, uh, to your resume or whatnot. But as long as you have an interesting story to tell, able to illustrate what you've learned from all these experiences, I think that's totally fine. Or if you're interested in participating, but your school does not offer it, you can always do things outside of your school, contributing to the community, participating in some of these community services outside of school, um, just to organizations within your region, within your community. That's also one way to do it. Thank you. And this one's gonna go to Sparsh. So I guess more on the logistical side of applying to schools. Uh, abroad, what is the process for getting a visa? And what are some struggles that you've had with the visa process in general? Cool. Uh, the process of getting a visa, um, typically students apply for the F1 visa when coming to college, but if there's other visa types that people in this room uh, have, have gone in the process with, uh, feel free to chime in. But this is the, this is the process that I'm most familiar with and the follow-ups to, to just the F1 process in general. 
Uh, the F1 visa is a student visa that you apply to for an undergraduate or a postgraduate education. Uh, if you're doing advanced studies, I think there's a different visa for that, but a uh, similar, similar story, there is a set of documents that you can find um, if you have access to the internet, which I'm assuming you do because you're on this call. Um, essentially, you look up the documentation that you require. Typically, this documentation involves anything from your uh, willingness and ability to be able to be in the US. Uh, there is some level of evidence for uh, you know the, the university you're going to. So there's documentation that they will provide uh, to you as well. And you can find these resources um, in the university websites uh, for the ones you plan to go to or intend to go to as well. Um, it's actually a very resource rich space when it comes to just applying for a visa and this whole visa process. Um, just because international students in the past have struggled with it. And so now uh, there's a good set of resources and Berkeley actually has a very solid set of resources for international students. If you uh, ever so wish to just look up what the process of applying to a visa is. Struggles you've had with the visa process. Uh, typically the struggles that international students have faced with the visa process um, more honestly just happens after you graduate from college, when you enter the work world, when you uh, start to figure out uh, how do you get a working permit? How do you make sure that your working permit stays valid for a period of time? Uh, there's a process to make sure that you are a, of, of valid status to be able to stay in the country. Um, there are some travel restrictions that can come with that. And so always make sure that you have some sort of communication going uh, with uh, officials with the university uh, to make sure that they are tracking where you are in this process. And, and use them as a, as a solid support. International students is, are as lost as, you know, the other international students are. So typically try to lean towards a resource or lean towards study hall college consulting uh, for, this, for these type of questions. Uh, we've gone through this process and we're still going through them. So uh, honestly, the, any struggles that you face, uh, there's, there's people like us out there to, to help you out with. Uh, there were more issues in the past. I think one of the benefits of this new administration is it's uh, a lot friendlier to international students uh, as compared to the previous administration. This is just for the, the United States. Um, and so an example of which is even though we have the pandemic going on, there's still a lot of countries that have been given a national interest exemption for it, just students to be able to travel, but others not being able to travel. So. Uh, rest assured, if that was any of your concerns when it comes to the immigration and visa environment in the U.S., it is very daunting, but it's, it's, it will improve and hopefully will stay okay-ish uh, with, this, with this new administration. Um, so yeah, if you have struggles, you know who you have to ask. Um, and if you don't know where to start, there's a ton of internet resources for this. Thank you for that really in-depth answer. This next question is going to go to Ishita. Why did you choose to go to college in the United States versus your home country or schools in Europe? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I actually want to start by echoing something that's first said earlier, which is if I had chosen to continue my education in India, I'm absolutely certain I would have gotten a really solid undergraduate education. Given that I was able to pursue education abroad, uh, something that I wanted to prioritize was being able to major in both English and economics, which are just very unrelated. And the U.S. offered me sort of the breadth of opportunities that made that possible. So I wouldn't have to go in knowing what area of study I wanted and having to commit to it from the get go. I wanted to have that freedom, that flexibility to, you know, study a range of different subjects. And in fact, um, I think most universities in the U.S. encourage you to take additional courses across different subject areas for a more holistic education. And that was something that I, I really valued. I also um, wanted to experience, you know, being engaged in research. I thought that was a really great opportunity that a lot of uh, US universities offered, you know, being taught by professors who are pioneering research in their fields and being able to offer those opportunities to, to their students, I thought was a, a really great benefit. And I found that the US offered me a really good balance between prioritizing my academics, but also extracurricular leadership opportunities. You know, I just having that sense of school spirit, being a part of this international network and 
and you know being engaged in a lot more on campus that made me feel really present and part of this community um, was something that that really drew me to a U.S. education and I didn't apply to schools in Europe so I can't really speak to that so I'll let someone else jump in. Oh yeah let me share something um, I can echo with Ishita on the on the flexibility that a U.S. education offered. So, I, so like I mentioned earlier, I applied to schools in the U.K. as well as in the U.S. And the main thing that came into, I mean, what made me choose the U.S. over the U.K. was the flexibility. Um, I didn't have to commit to a degree uh, and pursue that all through all three or four years, even though it's faster in the U.K., but I felt that being having the flexibility to pursue a double major and to have... Um, the, op the flexibility to, to change major was something that, um, that I really, that I wanted. Because at, at that point of time, I wasn't sure if that, that was something I wanted to commit to. And true enough, after going to the college in the US, um, I, I changed my major once and no regrets there. Because um, the first, first year or so gave me the chance to try out different classes, try out whether this, whether that major was really something I wanted to pursue before I commit myself into it. Because I think at a point of application, you, you just think about, okay, I might want to do major A, major B, major C, but you're not too sure without having taken actual courses, having, 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 haven't having spoken to people who pursued those majors. So it helped going to, into that space, into that community, speaking to seniors who pursued them before you really um, set yourself into doing it. Awesome. And last question for this section. And this one's going to go to Derek. And of course, all of us on this call are very proud Golden Bears. So why did you choose to attend UC Berkeley over the other colleges you were accepted into in the United States? Yeah, great question. I think the other panelists might have more sophisticated answers. But to me, it's actually a pretty simple reason. I find it to be very silly and dumb once I actually go to college and I hear people's um, process of choosing colleges to go to the factors that they consider for me I always want I always wanted to study business and I took the U.S. news rankings as my source of truth I applied to all the schools that were you know top 10 undergrad business education and Berkeley was the one that I got in that was at the forefront so I, I went to Berkeley by the way without knowing that the high school business you actually have to apply again so I remember you know um, going in my dorm room and chatting up with my roommates, both of them wanted to study business as well. And they started looking at business clubs. They were talking about applying to Haas. That's when I found out that you actually have to apply. So I think this is definitely a cautionary tale that definitely lean on the resources you have. And, you know, it should be a more uh, robust process in terms of the factors you, you think about, the environment, the career opportunities, uh, 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 the population, and the, the different academic opportunities that the school present are all factors that you should think about. For me, but for me, it was pretty simple. I just followed the rankings. I can chime in there a little bit. I do, I think, I mean, I agree with you. I think we are working with very limited information and resources, right? Like I did not have an opportunity to step foot on campus before I made my decision on where I could go. And there were some pretty logistical factors that made me lean towards UC Berkeley. I, I haven't grown up in a major city. I knew I wanted to be on a large campus. I placed a lot of value on being surrounded by people that I could constantly be inspired by and learn from and learn with. And so having a campus that was large, that was pretty close to a city was a big factor for me. Weather was a fairly big factor for me, having never really experienced like a winter, I knew that I wanted something that, you know, wouldn't really add to the stress of being, of studying abroad. And then, yeah, I mean, there, in, in terms of the information that I could find, I, I recognized that Berkeley had an incredibly great economics and English department. And so that definitely factored into my my decision making and I was fortunate enough to speak with both alumni from UC Berkeley as well as um, someone from my high school who was currently who was at the time attending UC Berkeley and just felt a really they all seemed to have a strong sense of community and affinity to UC Berkeley and that was definitely something that um, affected my decision as well. Awesome thank you so much and now we'll move on to our final section of tonight which is lifestyle. And this first question is going to go to Jade. 
how did you make friends in college? And was it easy or hard to meet people and actually make friends? Okay, the easiest place to start for me, thankfully, because I, I, I chose to stay in the dorms for my first year, was that resident hall. My floor mates, that was the first source um, to start. Um, also because I didn't go to campus early enough to participate in the international orientation programs or whatnot, because I think those started a week earlier um, in UC Berkeley, but it really depends on the school you choose to attend. Um, so my floor mates were the, were the first source I started to, I mean, were the first few, first group of people I started making friends with. And then it branched out from there, hanging out with friends of my floor mates, um, making friends when you attend classes, um, finding out student organizations they want to participate in. I think generally these are the three areas or three ways you can choose to find friends um, when you first step foot on campus. It wasn't, it might be challenging. I also understand if you have apprehension, uh, if you're scared to be outspoken in that first, to take that first step. But it honestly doesn't hurt, right? A simple high can go a long way. And it's, um, it's not that scary after all, after you've gone through it. Yeah, I think that's a great point because it can be so daunting to be surrounded by a whole new environment, so many different people that you've never met, but almost everyone's in the same boat as you, especially in the dorms, especially, you know, towards the beginning of your college life. Everyone's also been thrown into this huge sea of people and is trying to find new people to, to connect with, to make friends with. So that, you know, hopefully helps you be a little bit more at ease. And another thing that UC Berkeley did that I found to be helpful is that they usually recommend a certain number of units for your first semester. And it might seem like you could definitely take more units than that and, you know, maybe you would be fine. But I would honestly recommend sticking with that because that gives you a little bit more flexibility and time to join student orgs, to find your niche, to explore different community-based um, groups on campus. And yeah, like, you know, make sure you're, you're, if you have the time, if you have the capacity, you're exploring all of the different student groups on campus. I think that's a really great way to find people with similar interests or just really explore everything that's out there and meet, meet different people. Yeah. Oh, I'll just sorry, add, go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, there's also uh, community like forums and groups that exist before you even get on campus. Um, I graduated in 2020, so I was still part of the the class that still had Facebook as a relevant uh, forum, where there were a ton of Facebook groups uh, that were geared towards international students as well as international students specifically for the school you want to go to. And those can be good sources just for you to figure out, you know, very basic things like what bank account you want to get or what type of, you know, mobile service you want and things like that. And through which you can make a, a good chunk of people that you just sort of know before you even land in the country. That was helpful for me just to get my bearings and, you know, figure out life as you're initially just coming on board and you know have those things sort of figured out and through that maybe you make good friends um, i was lucky enough to make a ton of friends prior to even starting and some of them i'm still you know really good friends with and so uh, try to leverage any online forums and uh, communication channels you might have before you even uh, get on campus i think that since we had a remote uh, year of college these online forums might have become even more relevant uh, for incoming freshmen and i think that colleges are investing in that so uh, definitely tap into those before you even get here. Thank you. And this next question is going to go to Derek. So what is the biggest culture shock that you experienced going to college in the United States? Yeah, I think um, for someone who grew up in Taiwan, uh, pretty isolated, going through the local you know, educational system, the biggest culture shock to me when I first got to UC Berkeley was just how diverse the people you get to meet are like the panelists and some of whom I know, they're from all over the world. They all have different backgrounds. They all have different unique experiences. Everyone has different aspirations. I think that's genuinely a shock to me for someone, you know, I went to a local high school, all, all the people at my local high school would have gone to the same college, or studied most likely very similar majors and all had, you know, pretty, pretty similar backgrounds and upbringings to me. It was such a treat and a shock um, 
and so interesting to get to know so many people that have such different backgrounds and just the things they can bring to casual conversations, bring to different ideas, um, bring to class, bring to, you know, the workplace are, are genuinely very interesting and so diverse. That to me is the biggest shock and also one of the most, you know, unique parts and interesting parts to me uh, in pursuing an education in, in the States. Thank you. And at the beginning of the call, uh, a lot of you talked about your current roles or your current jobs, and many of you actually decided to stay in the United States. So why did you decide to stay after college graduation to work full time? And we can start with Ishita. Yeah, of course. Um, mine is kind of an unconventional story. I always thought that I would take on a pretty traditional finance role after university and then had the opportunity to work at the nonprofit that I'm currently with for a summer and realized that that was a whole new career op option that was available to me here that was so unique to being here that I probably wouldn't get that experience elsewhere. And so that led me on a whole new tangent in terms of where my career was headed. And I, I truly thought that it I would be able to add the most value and get the most value out of this role. And that was a huge factor in um, staying in the United States. And I've also found that I you know, really enjoy the work culture, really enjoy sort of the, the global nature of, of the work that I personally am doing. So it was a very personal decision for me to, to stay in the United States to work um, right after I graduated. Awesome. And in the interest of time, this will actually be tonight's last question. And of course, again, to the panelists, thank you guys so much for answering all of these questions. This one's going to go to Jade. For college move-in, how did you bring your items over? Did you bring a lot of belongings over or did you buy a lot of the stuff in America? Um, I think, so I've, I brought a mix of both. So for bulky items, I didn't I only purchased them in the US because it wasn't too expensive to begin with. It's like $10, $20 from Target if you need like. Oh, Jade, I think you're cutting out. Yeah, if anyone else has anything to add as well, um, maybe someone yep. else can go, we can come back. <laughs> Yeah, I can I can take this one uh, before Jay gets back in. So for me, I, Rachel probably knows I brought a legendary amount of stuff when I moved in. Um, so I'd say that's definitely another cautionary tale. A lot of the stuff, I think, especially the bulky items like Jade mentioned, can be purchased in America. You don't have to bring your own like comforter and your your own pillow. Um, but some of them I did bring. And I would say like definitely one other thing I would mention is definitely understand the dimensions of the place that you'll be living in. For, for me, you know, I never really, you know, saw any videos or understood just how big the dorm rooms were and how much space you would actually get. So, you know, when I got there with my inordinate amount of stuff, um, it, of course I couldn't fit it all into my room. So I think that's another, you know, major, point that I, I, I picked up from the whole experience was to really, you know, do your research and understand what type of living environment you're going to be, how many people you're going to be sharing your room with, what kind of storage uh, options and uh, space that you'll get just to prep yourself and understand what type of things you can bring and what type of things you can't. Thank you. And we'll go back to Jade. Uh, Jade, I think yes. you cut off I'm around. Right. Uh, yeah. Yes. That's the cons of not living in the U.S. and having that fast internet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, yes. The mention limitation was, I think, was something I wanted was a point I wanted to hammer on too. So I think going to the U.S., you are limited to two by twenty-three kilogram or fifty pounds, whichever. Uh, yeah. So whichever unit you're comfortable with. So packing things that will be essential to your first year um, within that space was something uh, I, I've tried to do. Right. So certain things were a lot more expensive in the US. I think contact lens solution was one. So I brought more when I went over. But yes, don't bring bulky items like pillows and comforters and bed sheets. Um, these are not worth the space, but bring things you actually need within your first year and ma maximize, optimize that, that space. 
Yeah, I think you should get snacks and like a ton of food. <laughs> I swear, uh, it helps with the home home homesickness, as well as the just you know you're you're just moving in. Some people come in with dietary restrictions and allergies, and you might just have certain things that like you need as part of that. And uh, keeping that sort of lifeblood with you and that comfort with you is helpful. See what's what's allowed. I don't think you can just get anything and everything when it comes to food. Uh, so always make sure you check those so the immigration and customs doesn't bother you with it. Uh, I'm sure international students have faced this all the time. Uh, but yeah, I think get 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 like your clothes and stuff, but definitely get food uh, with you. I'm sure your parents are also going to pack a ton of food. Uh, but yes, uh, food is important. Get it. That's awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for answering these questions. And I'll go ahead and give it to Rachel for some closing remarks. Great, yeah. Thank you all once again so much to our panelists for spending an hour on your Sunday to participate in this panel. Thank you to our attendees. We wanted to give you all a little bit more information about what we do here at Study Hall College Consulting. So we do have some free resources such as a free blog. So if you head over to our website, we post weekly blogs on our website ranging in many different topics from like college application advice to the college experience advice. So some of our recent blogs, we have what I wish I knew before applying to college, breaking down the common application essay prompts, the semester versus quarter system, how do you know which is right for you, and how you can find research opportunities. So we do post weekly advice. And also, if you wanted to suggest future blog topics that you wanted one of us to write about, you can submit a form at tinyurl.com slash shcc blogs. Additionally, we have a newsletter and social media similar to the blog where we're posting free advice on our social media pages, Instagram, Facebook. We are also posting a bunch more free tips and tricks. So definitely check those out and give us a follow. Additionally, on our newsletter, sign up for that on our website if you want to be the first to be updated on when we're having additional panels, different things that are happening in the college application world, as well as advice related. So definitely check those out. And once again, we wanted to thank you all for attending our panel today, both to the attendees and to our panelists. So for attending the panel to the end, if you did want to receive 10% off your next study hall college consulting purchase, you can fill out this form, which is tinyurl.com slash shcc panel. And so this discount is only for those who attended the panel live. But if you did miss any part of this panel and you wanted to watch it again or re-watch things, then definitely on our YouTube channel in the coming days, we will post the full panel. So check out our YouTube channel at Study Hall College Consulting. So we wanted to thank you all so much again. Hopefully you all found this panel helpful. Good luck for those of you who are applying to colleges this cycle and good luck to those of you who are going to college abroad next this year in a come in a few weeks almost so thank you all so much for watching and we will see you all next time goodbye everyone <laughs>